Hey guys, I live right on the coast here in New South Wales and have done for about 16 years now. So I don't think it will come as a surprise to anyone to learn that coastal photography is the central motif, if you will, of my portfolio. And like my waistline, my portfolio of coastal images is ever expanding as I tick off locations I've never visited before. I have photographed every single one of the 109 beaches in my local Shoalhaven council region, along with the nine in the Kiama region to the north, most of the 83 beaches in the Yurubadala region to the south, and a decent swag from the 150 beaches in the Sapphire Coast region in the far south. Now, I know I've got some way to go until I photograph all 11,962 beaches in Australia, but I reckon I'm further along than most. And if I've learnt one thing about beach photography along the way, it's that it's far too easy to take a shot that is boring as batshit. Because while all beaches are different, they're also fundamentally the same. Like a post-shag bed, they have a dry bit, and they have a wet bit. And while you may be grateful to hear that I do not have any unorthodox suggestions for ensuring your partner is always satisfied in the bedroom, I do have a few ideas for taking beach photographs that might attract an agreeable comment and not a dismissive swipe to the left. Enough with the innuendo. Here's my first suggestion. Get horizontal and do it on the sand. Now, this kind of shot works best with a wide or super wide lens. Anything under 24 mils will do the job, but I have used this technique on telephoto lenses too. The idea behind this shot is to narrow the volume of dead space above and below the center line of the shot. If you shoot head high with the camera viewfinder to your eye, then you'll have a region of boring space, one third above and one third below the center line. There will undoubtedly be very little within that large central void for the eyes to focus on and to appreciate. But if you put your camera close to the ground, then you can play to the benefits of that wide angle lens by bringing everything in much closer. You'll suddenly be able to make out all the markings on the sand, the seashells and all the cool bits of driftwood and detritus that collect on the foreshore. I strongly suggest you pre-focus your shot, preferably a short distance in front of the lens. If you want everything in focus, then choose a slower aperture such as f11. On my X-T4 with my 10mm super wide lens on the camera, the hyperfocal distance, that point from which everything beyond it is in focus, is a mere 40 centimeters. So I pre-focus about half a meter in front of the camera, get nice and low, sometimes literally resting the camera on the sand and take the shot. Of course, taking shots that low to the ground can be awkward, particularly if you're a fat bastard like me with arthritic knees. But that's why God invented pop-out screens. I have a small man Frotto Pixie tripod, which is perfect for this kind of shot and ensures that I don't get sand in any of my exposed orifices. My X-T4 has such a capable in-camera and in-lens stabilization system that I can shoot handheld at a fifth of a second without any problems, which means that I can even shoot this kind of super low level shot of waves breaking on the sand. Okay, technique two is to ensure you have foreground interest. I already touched on this in the previous point, but this issue of a void of dead space is the main reason most people take dull photographs of beaches. They forget that what might look pleasing to the eye on location does not work from a compositional perspective when captured from a camera. There are potential foreground opportunities on every beach if you actively look for them. Trees and bushes are obvious contenders, but people and animals can serve this purpose too. And so while you might be focused on the landscape, literally and metaphorically, Keep an eye out for potential opportunities such as seabirds that conveniently wander into your frame. But what if you can't find any foreground interest? Well, then you manufacture it, of course. 
One of the unspoken secrets behind many of the quality landscape photographs is that the photographer cheated and manually introduced some kind of foreground element. I've been known to drag a branch through 50 metres of bushland to provide some foreground interest in a shot. And I can guarantee I am not alone in this regard. On one occasion, I even untied a small dinghy, moved it to a more photogenic location, photographed it, and then returned it. Nobody any the wiser. As long as you're not vandalising anything and you put things back the way they were afterwards, then what's the harm? All right, my third suggestion is to try shooting long and very long exposure shots. Very long exposures require the use of an ND filter, such as a big stopper, to limit the amount of light reaching the sensor, particularly if you're shooting any time after sunrise or before sunset. With exposure times of 30 seconds or more, you can turn even the choppiest ocean into a mirror-like lake. These kinds of very long exposure shots can become almost abstract and they're the cornerstone of every so-called fine art photographer's portfolio. So why not get in on the action and knock out a few fine art photos yourself? In terms of the technicalities, the principal issue you'll face in an environment like the beach is keeping that camera rock solid for the duration of the exposure. This is particularly tricky when you're photographing on sand since the tripod can shift and sink downwards such that you won't notice it, but it will impact the sharpness of the image. So if you're shooting on sand, before you push the shutter button, push the tripod right down as far as you can. This will help limit the amount of movement, but always check the shot afterwards and make sure you zoom in on that preview to see the detail. Of course, the movement of waves onto a beach and over rocks are very popular subjects for photography and require exposure times in the half second to fifth of a second range. If you're photographing movement of water over rocks, half a second will probably be best, but for waves I've found that one fifth is the sweet spot. All right, my fourth tip for beach photography techniques is to flip your perspective. Now, traditionally, when we shoot on a beach, we look out to the ocean, but assuming there isn't a massive swell rolling in, there's nothing stopping you from wading out a short distance and shooting back in towards the beach. Now, I live year round in cargo shorts and a pair of Crocs worn slicker than a Formula One racing car's dry weather tires. And so I think nothing of just wading into the ocean to get a cool shot looking back. But it might require a bit more planning on your part if you wear proper boots and long pants. Now, obviously a tripod is not gonna cut it unless the ocean is extremely calm. So leave it on the beach and shoot handheld. As I mentioned, my X-T4 is incredibly capable with its stabilization systems and I can shoot handheld with relatively long exposures. But if your camera lacks IBIS, you'll want to shoot somewhere north of a hundredth of a second to ensure some sharpness in your shot. And if you are going to photograph in the ocean, looking back to the land, remember to stay aware. Surf lifesavers say you should never turn your back on the ocean because it's unpredictable. You get long period swells with outsized waves that can surprise even the most experienced beachgoer. So keep your eyes pointed towards the horizon in between shots. All right, my fifth tip is to get yourself a drone and shoot from the skies. Now, I know that there's this snobbish attitude towards drones from the more, shall we say, invested members of the photographic community, but really, they're just missing out on some incredible photographic opportunities. Placing your camera up in the air means you can explore all of the angles and all of the perspectives and create unique images. For instance, how often does a landscape photographer point their camera straight down at the ground? Not often, I'm guessing, because having only a meter of distance between your camera and the ground does not suggest a terribly interesting composition. Unless you've discovered a dog shit with wistful architectural promise, a shot of the ground will be singularly dull. However, when you increase that distance to 30 meters or 120 for that matter, that's when it gets interesting. When you point a drone camera straight down, you start seeing all sorts of cool stuff such as abstract patterns that would otherwise be completely invisible to you. 
So if you're a bit of a purist, I say pull your head out your ass and buy a drone. They're still cameras, they just fly. Alrighty then, that's it for this video, guys. If you've always returned from a trip to the beach with a bunch of boring images, then hopefully my tips will inspire you to try something a bit different next time. Do you ever visit the beach for photographic locations or do you prefer solid ground, lonely trees in fields, forests and mountains? As always, let me know in the comments down below and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this video helpful. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank all of you who subscribed and pushed me over that 1000 barrier. I greatly appreciate the support and hope you enjoy all the forthcoming videos I have planned. Thanks also to the folks that get offended by my swearing. I always get a kick out of your emails. Till next time, fuckers. Ta-ta.